Dear students, good evening. Welcome to Law Excellence IAS. Let us do the editorial analysis for today. That is 29th December 2022. The first article, India must build awareness on population control. With regard to population in India, it is highly politicized. It has become a tool to show minorities as uh, someone who is not concerned with the national interest. Majority is something which is, or majoritarian population is some, something which is trying to control the population. See carefully, population is highly politicized and religious issue today. In this scenario, let us see the facts on the ground. India's efforts towards the population control are very successful now. India is at the level of replacement fertility rate today. In this case, population control shall not be seen from majoritarian, political or religious perspective. So today, there is drop in fertility rate, we all know. What is fertility rate? The number of children a couple is having is fertility rate. So TFR is to be less than 2.1. This is called as replacement level of fertility rate. Almost all the states other than UP, Bihar, Rajasthan achieved this replacement level of fertility rate. I'll give you certain factors or facts. Analyze the situation. Among the poor, irrespective of their religion, the fertility rate is high. Either Hindus, Muslims, anyone. Among the poor, the fertility rate is high. And most of the poor exist among Muslims. And Muslims have high fertility rate. When we correlate these three things, you will understand the poverty more than the religion is the major cause of higher fertility rate. The poverty is the major reason. Why? Poor people will have more children. The poor people see children as a hedge against any risk in the future. Let's take a rich man. He has a good house, car, bungalow, everything. This man has many other economical instruments to hedge his risk. But for a poor man, his children are a hedge against the risk. So poverty is more directly correlated with uh, product, I mean, fertility rather than the religion. Second thing is, as I said, the fertility rate is falling. So where it is falling, it is falling more among the Muslims. In this context, the gap between Hindus and Muslims in 90s is around 1.1. Average a Muslim couple has more than one child. But today it has come down to 0.35. If you see the economic difference between them, fertility difference between them, we can clearly say that the minorities are able to adopt these population control measures very well compared to the majority. And second is, we also need to understand one child policy, etc. are coercive population control measures. They do not yield good results. Remember, China has got this one child policy. Today, if you observe, there is gender imbalance in China. Sex ratio is very adverse. As most of the people want a male child, ultimately it led to more male population with fewer girls available. Second thing, demographic imbalance. So in any society, you need to have working population, children, and then age-old population. If a society gets older, then the society also becomes unsustainable and unproductive. So if you take about Japan, China today, Southeast Asia in Asia itself, we have this aged population problem. So that's where a society, if it has to be demographically stable and then gender-wise balanced, coercive measures for population control will not work. What we have to do? So first is build awareness. Improve the health infrastructure. Why people will have more children? When children, they are not guaranteed that they will live for long. So they try to have more children, at least one or the other will be alive to look after them. So that's where, if there is a guarantee that every child born will be alive, with good health infrastructure, people conceive less. So improve the healthcare facilities. And then development and economic prosperity. These are the two factors that are critical for population control. The next is labored wages. MG Narega, it is a demand-driven program. 
rights based approach a demand driven rights based program in this case a person who is seeking work so he has to seek the work as a matter of right and bureaucracy it has a responsibility to give the work and pay these people on time so that's why the rights based approach is the basis for mg narega national food security act etc today government is giving work but not paying them on time whatever may be the reasons so this is called wage delay obviously people are not able to use their rights effectively because of this wage delay second thing is government is trying to solve every problem in a technocratic way today to increase the productivity of the work under mg narega government wants to take compulsory attendance the digital attendance at the work site many a times there will be no connectivity there will be no cell phone through which it can be captured so without addressing this if you are bringing the technocratic solutions uh, they are expected to fail in the field that's what we have to understand next is turning tide it is about balance of payments current account situation in india now if you observe increased oil costs have widened the current account deficit but in november current account deficits got narrowed because of two reasons one is our goods exports have improved and the second thing is the petrol prices also gets got softened in this scenario 2023 is going to be a challenge year for indian exports according to wto international trade is expected to grow only by 1% the recession is already visible in the europe and united states of america and third thing what can be the question for india's balance of payments our services sector and remittances what are remittances the money which is been sent by expats who are living abroad back home these are called as remittances high remittances and services these are expected to protect india from bop shocks in 2023 Nepal politics past present and future you know 2008 monarchy in nepal is abolished and it has a republic is born was born in this royalists were replaced by elected president today who are responsible yesterday who are responsible for this the maoism maoist led by prachanda is responsible for this after that communist parties of nepal maoists united marxist leninist these have come together on ideological thing and then they got split and these people joined with nepali congress and then these have contested the elections now again these maoists have come together with uml this clearly shows the opportunism so more than driven by ideology they are been driven by opportunism the royalists and maoists who fought with each other together are forming a government today in this case one thing we have to understand very clearly india is been shown as a neighbor who is not working in the interests of its i mean the tiny country nepal so in this case india is been more shown as a glitch for nepal rather than one which is working for nepal they used the word foreign interference very regularly for this so when they talk about foreign interference they are talking about india so what is the way forward for india in this situation india has to develop people to people contacts build its a trust and the second factor is whatever the infrastructure projects which india has undertaken which can improve the life living standards of the people over there these have to be completed there are certain pending issues when demonetization has happened many of the people there are were holding indian rupees what to do with it and second thing is gorka regiment <coughs> after agnipath scheme has started the recruitments are not been taken up because of the practical issues these things have to be settled next is the legal hurdles in freeing hindu temples many of the hindu temples are in the control of the state the state takes care of the administrative matters but it will not involve with the religious matters there 
Now, why the state has to take up these administrative, man, administrative issues or manage the properties of the temples? In this case, um, the Shirur Mud judgment is very important. In Tamil Nadu, there is an act um, that is called Tamil Nadu Religious and Charitable Endowments Act, which has come up in 1959. Tamil Nadu Religious and Charitable Endowments Act. So this has given the state the control over the temples. Like that every state has got an act to control the temples. And Supreme Court has upheld this and the state is required to protect these religious properties from misgovernance. And Ramaswamy Iyer, a committee was established. It also recommended for the state role for administratively controlling the religious institutions like temples. Because of the state involvement, certain reforms have come up. If you take in Tamil Nadu, the backward castes are being appointed as the priests. That itself is a good development. So integrated temple management systems, protection of temple properties, taking the litigation in support of the temple, all these are the activities being done by endowments. So that's where the state taking up the responsibility of the temple also has led to a kind of social reform, improvement in their governance. A failed attempt at decriminalization. Here I want to talk about this Jan Vishwas bill. So in India, when we make the laws, we see from an idealistic perspective. And in this context, we try to punish every deviation. Every deviation we try to punish. So in this case, either it is Forest Act, for that, man, for that matter, Environment Protection Act, Air Act, and uh, Drugs and Cosmetics Act, Cinematography Act, Patents Act, many acts. Um, these are, these are having penal provisions. Now, government wants to remove these penal provisions and convert them as penalties. Remove the penal provisions and convert them as penalties. So, this is the objective of Jan Vishwas bill. So, they are not removing them as offenses. Decriminalization means they have to remove them as offenses itself. But they are not doing that. They are just changing the nature of punishment. It do not come under the decriminalization. That is the argument here. What is the proposal to ban the sale of single cigarettes? So single cigarette means rather than selling a pack, the here they are going to sell one stock of or stick of cigarette. One single stick. Normally young people want to start smoking. Poor people, they buy the single sticks rather than buying the pack. So that way they can discourage young people getting adopted to cigarette smoking. That is the idea behind this. These are the articles for today. Thank you very much. Have a great day.